Hi everybody, in this um, lecture we're going to continue where we left off. Um, we talked a lot about x-ray interactions, all the different kinds of labels and things like that. Um, what we're going to get to in this um, lecture is x what happens when x-rays are impinging on a medium. And, um, you know, by medium what we mean is like something. It could be a layer of lead, it could be one of our patients, um, it could be um, the air in the room or something like that. Um, and so hopefully by the end of this, you'll have a better idea of how all that works. Um, so photons traveling through a medium, they can be transmitted, right? Anytime an x-ray goes past an atom, it has a chance of not interacting with it at all. Um, in fact, it can get all the way through me or a strip of lead or something like that without um, interacting with it at all. Um, it can be absorbed by that medium. Something like, remember, pair production absorbs x-rays. Um, photoelectric effect absorbs x-rays. Or it can be scattered. Remember, Compton does scattering, Raleigh does scattering, things like that. Um, so it can be transmitted, absorbed, or scattered in a different direction. Um, a lot of times we call the primary radiation, that's the photons that traverse a certain medium without having interacted. So if the x-rays get through without being touched at all, that's the primary beam coming from the primary source. Um, and then we call, talk about secondary radiation. So secondary radiation or x-rays are photons that have been scattered by the medium as a result of changing direction. So any x-rays that come in and do um, pair production and produce new x-rays from the positron annihilation, that's secondary x-rays. If they do Compton effect and that x-ray goes in a new direction, that's a secondary radiation or Raleigh scattering. Um, things like that are part of the secondary radiation beam. And that secondary beam is important because it scatters x-rays um, kind of uniformly away from where they interacted, which whereas the primary beam is just coming from the x-ray source. Um, so the attenuation of x-rays, this is the removal of photons or x-rays as a result of tissue absorption or scatter from a photon beam as it passes through matter. So that's what attenuation is. Um, and a lot of times we have, <clears throat> um, what it looks like to us as a user depends on whether it's a narrow beam or broad beam geometry. Here we're calling the narrow beam the good geometry and the broad beam the poor geometry. Those are kind of like, um, not really appropriate labels, it's not like this one's good and this one's bad. Um, but what's happening here is that in this situation we have an x-ray beam starting here. We have an x-ray detector inside the medium somewhere and here we have our attenuator so we have this slab of lead here which is our attenuator inside of it so you can consider everything else to be air. Um, under the good narrow beam geometry the x-rays are going to come in the jaws of the machine are set very narrow and so only a small part of the beam is going to interact with this um, or the beam is going to be very narrow as it comes to interact with this attenuator and like some of these x-rays which are scattered some of the secondary x-ray beam they're actually scattered away from the detector and they won't be measured by this detector at all. Contrast that with the situation where the collimator is open wide and we have a wide attenuator there. Some of these x-rays are going to come along, they're going to interact, they're going to do Compton or something like that, and the new x-ray, um, which has a slightly less energy, is going to come in and it's going to get detected by this detector. So under the narrow beam geometry, x-rays are going to scatter away from our detector and not be measured. We're going to measure more attenuation, apparent attenuation, um, with this beam than we will with this beam because some of these x-rays are going to scatter back towards our detector um, and be detected. Um, so it's a situation where um, the number of x-rays that were headed towards this detector and potentially detected could be the same for these two situations, right? You could have the exact same number of x-rays headed towards this detector, but this detector will give us our measure less radiation compared to this one, only because some of these x-rays are scattered back towards it. Um, under the narrow beam geometry, the number of monoenergetic or same energy photons transmitted through a given material of thickness x um, exponentially decreases as the thickness increases. So this equation right here is the basic x-ray attenuation formula. So the intensity I of x-rays coming out of a material of thickness x 
which has attenuation coefficient mu is determined by this equation where the I naught is the incident x-rays, the initial number of x-rays coming into the attenuator. And we use this formula e to the minus mu x um, to determine the um, attenuation of it. Mu is the known as the linear attenuation coefficient. It's called linear because it's in a straight line. The dimensions of x are units of length um, and the uh, units of mu are one per length. So if x is in centimeters, mu has to be in one over centimeters. Um, and the intensity, a lot of times for the equations we use and the calculations we do, it can be different quantities. Um, it can be like intensity of x-rays. So I could tell you that I is equal to 100 x-rays. Um, it could be a radiation measurement. So I could tell you that an x-ray detector is counting some number of x-rays um, at my detector and I want to attenuate that beam. It could also be something like radiation dose. Like if we're talking about um, total body radiation lung blocks, I could tell you that I want the attenuator to take the dose down by half or something like that. Um, so, you know, what the quantity of I and I naught are, um, sometimes we substitute in different things to make our equations work the way we want to. So here's a simple attenuation calculation. So if I give you this equation, I want to know what is the intensity of this x-ray beam after it's been attenuated by x amount of some material. Um, you need to know the mu of it. I need to know the linear attenuation coefficient. I need to know x, how thick it is, and what I naught is. So unless I give you these three inputs, you cannot calculate what the um, attenuation of that um, substance is. So in this simple example, I'm going to give you, so mu, let's say, is equal to 71 per centimeter. X is equal to 1.01 centimeters. And the initial intensity of the x-ray beam is 890 x-rays, something like that. I didn't put any units on there. Um, if I follow this formula, I'm going to do this um, calculation first. Mu times X, 71 per centimeter times 1.01 centimeters, I get... 0.71 out of it. If I plug this into the exponential, use that special function in your calculator, I get e to the minus, right, there should always be a minus up here, minus 0.71, I get um, 0 0.49. So if i is equal to 890 x-rays coming in, i multiplied by this quantity here, 0.49, I get 431.1 x-rays coming out on the other side of the attenuator. Um, now mu is the attenuation coefficient. We call it the linear attenuation coefficient. And the description of it physics-wise is that it's the fraction of incident photons that are attenuated, removed from the beam per unit distance. Uh, if we're using um, SI units, that's once per meter. Um, and it's dependent upon the energy of the incident photons and the composition of the media. So mu, when you use mu, you have to know what your x-ray energy is, and you have to know what is the thing that the x-ray is going through. So those two things you need to know. Um, we have this quantity that's very useful. It's called half-value layer. Um, and in this situation, I'm talking about a monoenergetic beam. So this is... Uh, x-ray beam of only one energy, which um, oftentimes is the case in brachytherapy, but in radiotherapy using Linux is not the case, but it's the easy situation to talk about first, so I'll do that. Um, the half value layer is the thickness of material required to reduce the intensity or number of x-ray photons transmitted through the medium by one half. It's a pretty simple concept. Um, you know, I could have an x-ray detector, I'm detecting 100 x-rays. I'd rather it be 50. How much material do I have to put between my x-ray source and my detector to count 50 x-rays instead of 100? That's basically what the half value layer is. Um, it's pretty easy to calculate. Um, in this formula, I'm using n instead of i, but if the outcoming x-rays divided by um, the unattenuated x-rays is equal to 1 half, I can set that equal to um, the exponent of minus mu x. I take the natural log of both sides 
and then I get the natural log of 1 half is 0 0.693, which is equal to the natural log of this side is just minus mu x. I can then um, cross out the minus sign on both sides, throw the mu, divide both sides by mu, and I get that um, x, which is the half value layer, is equal to 0.693 divided by mu. So if I give you any attenuation coefficient, you should be able to calculate what the half value layer is um, of any substance. Um, and then this is just a diagram showing like if this thickness of this material is one of our half value layers and I have 100 x-rays here, I'm going to get 50 after one half value layer. I'm going to get 25 at the next one. Rounding up, I'm going to get 13. I guess it should be 12 and a half, but we rounded up to 13. And then here, rounding correctly, I'm going to get 6 out of this. And you see the half value layer is the same uh, for each of these. Um, and what I'm talking about here is monoenergetic x-rays. Um, so the half value layer is constant. Because the x-ray energy is not changing as it gets attenuated by each of these half value layers, um, the energy of that x-ray beam is basically going to stay the same. If we have an 80 um, keV x-ray beam and it goes through a whole bunch of different half value layers, um, that x-ray energy on average is going to get to be 80 every single time. Um, so for a single energy x-ray beam, a monochromatic x-ray beam, um, the number of photons is um, reduced, but the average energy is constant. So every single half value layer is the same. Um, the reason why this is important is because um, in reality, we aren't always using monoenergetic x-ray beams. I've already run through this calculation. Um, we've done this calculation already, um, but an easy thing to do is you have this reduction in beam intensity can be expressed as 1 half to the n, where n is the number of half value layers. So if I tell you how many half value layers I have and I want to know um, what the reduction in intensity of that x-ray beam is, you can simply take 1 half and multiply, or not multiply it, but um, put it to the nth power. So if I have two half value layers, um, you, know, you can calculate what that would be. It would be a quarter. Um, another very useful concept, it's particularly useful for shielding, is known as the 10th value layer. The 10th value layer is basically the same concept as half value layer, but instead of being half, it's a 10th. It's the thickness of material that attenuates the photon beam by 90%. It only trans emits one-tenth of the incident x-ray beam. So once again, I have this equation. Um, the outgoing intensity of x-rays divided by the incoming is equal to one-tenth. I set it equal to this. Take the natural log of both sides. The natural log of one-tenth is minus 2.303. And then just divide by the linear attenuation coefficient, and I get x is equal to the tenth value layer, which is 2.303 divided by mu. And this is often used for shielding calculations. So a lot of times in shielding, we may find out that the beam is a thousand times more intense than we need it to be. So then we probably need three tenth value layers to reduce it um, to what would be safe for um, people working in the department or patients sitting in a waiting room or something like that. <clears throat> so in real life, we do not have, for the most part, uh, monochromatic x-ray beams. So in the previous example, I had just an 80 keV x-ray beam. Um, we usually have some sort of average photon energy. So our x-ray beams may be comprised of 30, 45, 60, 80, and 120 um, x-rays and everything in between. Um, and one important key here is that the attenuation coefficient is going to be higher for the 30 and the 45 than it is for the 80 and the 120 this side of the x-ray beam is going to get attenuated more than the higher energy ones. So you can see the way it's diagrammed here, we lose more of these low energy x-rays quicker and more of these high energy ones get through. Um, this is what we call in radiation therapy, it's a, a jargon term, but it's beam hardening. So beam hardening is when um, our beam starts to go through our patient and as that beam goes through our patient, 
the beam becomes more penetrating as it becomes because we've gotten rid of the x-rays that attenuate quickly and we're left with x-rays that are able to penetrate more. And this is important in our physics calculations. We have to take this into effect because if we do not, uh, we're going to end up miscalculating the dose as the um, x-ray beam gets deeper inside the patient. Um, another way to describe this is that the average energy of this x-ray beam goes up. So as all these low energy x-rays get attenuated away, and by the time I get out to here, I only have 120 keV x-rays left. All of the low energy ones got attenuated away, and the average energy of this beam uh, went up over time. So it's not um, possible to describe the transmission of a polychromatic x-ray with this simple um, attenuation coefficient. Uh, we have to do a lot more calculus, and we have to integrate in um, a changing attenuation coefficient as it gets deeper, um, you know, because each photon energy is um, attenuated by different values of the linear attenuation coefficient. It varies quite a bit. It's like way beyond um, our course. But the important thing is that as the beam hardens, as the beam shifts to higher energy x-rays, it takes more material to attenuate the same amount of beam. And so the half value layers are not the same. Um, the first half value layer is going to be less than the second, the third, the fourth, or the nth. And it's going to take more material to attenuate the intensity of this x-ray beam the same amount as we get deeper and deeper inside the lead shielding or the patient or something like that. Um, and so this is the description. So here's like um, log of the transmission. This is a linear attenuation for a monoenergetic beam. And then the uh, polyenergetic beam, which is what we use in the clinic, is going to attenuate different. Um, so shifting topics here, we're going to go to mass attenuation coefficient. Um, the density of the material is important. Um, and the density inside our patients change um, for different types of body tissue. So for example, an easy one is our lungs. Our lungs are filled with a mixture of air, which is not very attenuating at all and all of the tissue and blood that make up our lungs. Um, it's very helpful to us as medical physicists to eliminate that attenuation or that difference in attenuation because of density. And we come up with this a mass, atten mass attenuation coefficient, which has un SI units of meters squared per kilogram. Um, so it's dependent on the energy of the incident photons and the Z of the medium. So we kind of take the density out of it and then when we do our radiation ca calculations, we're going to multiply it back in. Um, and then we have these weird things that can happen when we start talking about this. So um, the probability of the interaction is dependent upon the number of atoms of a photon encounters per unit distance. And this will vary depending on the density of the material. So if we take something that's um, homogeneous like um, liquid water, um, liquid water, solid water, and water vapor. Let's say this is in a vacuum, so it's just water vapor. Um, the density is temp temperature dependent. And then in this weird example, uh, we know that like um, ice floats on top of water. So its attenuation of the solid ice is less than the attenuation of the water. And certainly the water vapor has the lowest density and um, the least attenuation. Um, in this example here. So for the mo for most of the time, it's solid is more attenuating than liquid than vapor, but for water and ice, we have water is uh, more attenuating than ice or water vapor. It's like one quirky example from our universe. Um, but the important thing here is that um, here's a graph of attenuation coefficient in centimeters squared per gram for different materials. Um, here I have tissue, bone, and water, and then also gold. And the reason why I put gold in here is because uh, oftentimes we put gold markers, particularly inside of our prostate patients, to make it easier to localize these organs. Um, and you can see, <clears throat> you can ask the question, like, why is a gold marker visible in an x-ray image? And if we're using x-ray energies that are in this area, the simple answer is, um, well, gold has a different photoelectric effect because of its high Z, and we can easily see it here. Um, a lot of times people give the answer that um, gold is more dense, right? So um, 
back in the olden days when we were imaging with our mega voltage electron beam, so we were doing imaging up in this region, um, theoretically, you wouldn't be able to see the gold markers because the attenuation coefficient coming up here towards where Compton effect is most important all comes out to be the same, except this isn't taking density into account. When we take density into account, you can see that the gold markers are much more dense than uh, water, bone, and tissue. Um, and you're, you start to be able to see the differences between these things. Um, another thing you'll notice in here is like um, tissue is plotted in blue, but you never see that blue line in this graph. Can you, I, think, I think you can see it right there. I don't know if you, it comes through in the recording. Um, because um, tissue and water are very similar in terms of what uh, their atomic composition and their density. So it's very difficult um, to see any difference between any of these tissues inside of our patients. Um, likewise with bone, um, you can see bone here just a little bit. It's really not that different until we multiply in the um, density of bone. So here the density of bone is a little bit higher. We can just barely see it. Um, and certainly when we shoot um, x-rays, we can see bones quite easily. And when we get up to higher energies, you get that little bit of separation um, that comes out between these two. Um, so a lot of times what I tell people is, particularly at mega voltage energies, <clears throat> the reason why we're able to see anything in any x-ray image is because, partly because things have different atomic compositions. Um, in this graph right here, you can see tissue, bone, and water are all very close. Um, when the density of bone is taken into account, there's a little bit of separation, so we're able to do x-rays and see people's bones. Um, the reason why we're able to see gold markers on perhaps megavoltage images um, is because gold is so much more dense than tissue or bone in any of our um, images. Um, so just to, just to reiterate and help to emphasize that point, um, when we're doing imaging, the reason why we're able to see anything is because it has different attenuation coefficients or it's thicker and is attenuating the beam more. Um, if you have a thin bone hiding in some tissue, you may not see it. If you have a big thick bone um, in and amongst tissues, like thick bones in our arms and our legs and things like that, um, it should show up pretty well because there's a lot of bone which attenuates the beam a lot more and it shows up, which helps explain why um, sometimes when you look at the image of the bone, you can see the edges of it very well because there's a lot of bone going through there and things like that. Um, so that's part of the reason like when we do, um, back before we had KV imaging, we would put gold markers inside the patient. It was so much easier to see it. Um, these days with Cone Beam CT, um, we have a hard time determining the difference between um, let's say the urine in the bladder, the bladder wall, which is tissue, and the prostate, which is tissue in there. So we put a gold marker inside the comb MCT so we can see that. So we kind of um, use the properties of the attenuation coefficient so we can image things. And then if we can't see them with the images, we'll throw gold markers in there or something like that to make it easier. Um, and here's an example of that image quality. Um, you can see here, this is a KV X-ray Acquired at 75 um, kilo um, volts um, for the x-ray tube. You know, we're predominantly photoelectric interaction, and we can see these three markers. And this is the exact same patient um, imaged with a 6 MV proton beam. And you can still see these um, markers inside the patient. I guess this one is right there, um, and the bones largely disappeared. This air bubble shows up very well um, in these two um, images and it just kind of gives you an idea of um, how visible all these things are. This image here has been processed so it's probably not really fair to compare these two um, directly. Here's another example of image quality to get a sense of how much something attenuates and how it comes out in the image. And here's a whole bunch of different things that I found in the clinic. So we have a beacon, carbon marker, gold coil. We have a silver marker, which you probably would never use in a person. Some kind of BB that I don't know what it's made out of. 
Um, we have a gold marker, which is typical of what we use for our prostate patients. So these two are typical. This one's short and this one's a bit longer. So this is kind of typical of what we use. Um, and you can see in the CT scanner, it looks differently on cone beam CT. It looks differently. On the KV X-ray, all of these are easily visible. Uh, but then on the megavoltage X-ray, um, this is a Calypso beacon, which is a technology we're not using anymore. This carbon marker, this marker made out of carbon disappears gold coil disappears, the silver marker disappears, this BB is probably made out of gold because it's starting to become visible, this gold marker is visible right there and right there, and you can even see sometimes like um, this silver marker would probably be visible if it didn't happen to just fall right on top of the tennis racket of the treatment machine, I think you can sort of see it there, um, but it's a, it's a good example of how when different things overlap in an x-ray image they can disappear. Um, another concept that I wanted to introduce here was um, this um, the Hounsfield unit of the CT scanner. We talk a lot about Hounsfield units, um, so we should uh, talk about it a bit. Um, the Hounsfield unit, uh, which is um, abbreviated to just the HU, it is the um, linear attenuation coefficient of part of the CT scanner, um, subtracting off the linear attenuation coefficient of water, then dividing that whole thing by water and multiplying it by a thousand. So that's the definition of the Hounsfield unit. Um, and it's important to get a, a good concept of Hounsfield units because it helps you understand why some things turn out bright in a CT scan and why some things turn out dark. So the CT scanner um, does not know what material attenuated the beam, only what the total attenuation happens. So if you have the x-ray tube here and these x-rays cross through this phantom down to the detector, this is going to do an integration of the attenuation coefficients and get some sort of intensity. It's going to measure the intensity that actually got through the detector. Um, and then, you know, by orbiting around, it's able to um, determine, um, you know, do, do a whole bunch of mathematics and reconstruct what this slice looked like. Um, and using this CT density phantom, we have this phantom that has all these different circles of different materials in it. You know, there could be air, water density, bone density, and things like that. We're able to calibrate um, this um, CT scanner so that we know um, exactly, we can calibrate in how many Hounsfield units each one of these different things um, is attenuating by. Um, and this is important for um, <clears throat> radiation therapy because the Hounsfield units, remember, attenuation is dependent upon the x-ray energy and when we're imaging um, using our CT scanner we're using x-rays that are in this range and all those attenuation coefficients are different compared to the therapy range so in the therapy range they're all going to change a little bit um, the KV x-rays are mostly using photoelectric effect the MV x-rays are mostly using Compton and we have to use a, a phantom that looks like this one here's a photograph and a CT scan calibrate this out. So um, our CT scanner is very good at measuring Hounsfield units. What we really need is um, the Compton measured electron density relative to water. And so we get um, a calibration curve like this. And when we use this calibration curve, we're able to convert our CT scan into attenuation needed for megavoltage dose calculation. Another thing that's helpful for everyone in this class is um, what Hounsfield units typical um, different materials come in and probably what I'll do is I'll add that to a future lecture because I don't have it in this slide right now um, but this one's coming up on about a half an hour of lecture so I'm gonna hold this here in the next lecture we're gonna get into um, interaction of charged particles with matter which for us is basically electrons and I will talk about protons a little bit so thank you for watching